Well, hello, I'm Jeremy Key, and welcome to Primetime. Uh, we got some great educational things to tell you about bees. Uh, and, and not the wasp kinds you're going to swat, and I've got an ant that would run and knock down uh, a, a whole building just to get away from a fly that she thought it was a bee. And uh, But we're going to be educated on about honeybees versus yellow jackets and uh and uh, you'll be able to tell a little bit of difference about them and i've got a man here that will just stick his hand in a whole hive and we're going to show you a little video of this one too not his whole hands going down in it but all these bees that he he got uh got from spartanburg up there and uh I tell you, I learned a little bit, a uh, little bit more uh, about bees than I knew, which was nothing. And you're going to learn a lot. But we'll be right back, and you will be able to ask questions, call in, and if you have a question about bees, or if you're going to start a beehive, what it's going to take, what it's going to cost, and don't expect to get rich. It's got to be a good hobby. Uh, it's like most things is, uh, that we think that that's powerful and rich. Sometimes it just ends up just spending money and just having fun doing it, enjoying it as a hobby. So we'll be back right after this message and our sponsors from Pagana Mexican Restaurant, 441 North Duncan Bypass, Union, South Carolina, 864-429-4043. La Pagana, your family Mexican restaurants, has appetizers, child's plates, salads and soups, sandwiches and desserts. Sizzling fajitas, Texas fajitas, shrimp fajitas. Also, they have great chicken, polo asado, chicken tenders, polo loco, and many more. If you like seafood, they have that also. Fish tacos, shrimp cocktail. They have many combinations that you can choose from in different price range. Matter of fact, they have 35 different ones. If you're a vegetarian, that's right, they can accommodate you also. Lunch menu, they have the Speedy Gonzales and about 13 others that you can make a combination with. That's La Pagada. La Pagada Mexican Restaurant, 441 North Duncan Bypass and Union, South Carolina, 429-4043. Okay, I'm back with you, and I'm going to turn you over to Frank, the professional beekeeper is frank tiller and uh frank i'm just i'm so glad that you came and uh to be with us a little bit how did you get started in bees what what what, what call, uh, caused you to say one day hey there's a bee hey i want to collect them <laughs> well um it really really goes back uh when i was a child my father's brother my uncle in king street south carolina was sort of the premier bee keeper um, of Williamsburg County. Uh, he was really into it in a big way. He actually made his own boxes, uh, his hives, as well as raised his own bees. And I always sort of thought it was interesting, but I never really paid close attention to it. Later on, uh, advanced 40 or 50 years, um, I bought some property that I started growing some corn and some vegetables, and I had a problem. I needed to have them pollinated. And you, know, you can have, you can actually go out and handshake the, the, the whatever it is, the, the corn silks and stuff like that to help pollination and the tomatoes and everything else. Or you can get some bees. I had no bees. And uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll get into that. And then a friend uh, actually approached me. He says, 
I see that you got some acreage. You know, would you be interested in having some hives? I said, I know nothing about it. <laughs> so the deal was that I would front the materials, whatever it was, the bees, the bees, he would manage them all. So I said, that sounds like a good relationship because I don't have time being full-time construction and full-time real estate. I had no idea how much time it would involve, and I didn't have the time to put into that, but I did want to re reap the benefit, not necessarily of the honey, but of the pollination side of it. So the pollination side, as uh, far as that helps other things grow. See, people don't realize that uh, it helps uh, your your farming, uh, your plants, trees, and without the pollination, uh, in those the bees are the most valuable insects on the on the earth. Um, without them, we're all dead. So they're extremely uh, beneficial. Now, if you want to call in, there's a number you'll see right there on your screen, 864-441-9382. You can call in if you have a question to uh, ask Frank. And now, Frank, most people really don't know what a honeybee versus a yellow jacket. I know you have here some, uh, some Italian, Russians, mutts, what, is that different types of bees? or is that They are. Everybody says, well, what kind are you raising? Well, when you think about it, you know, if they were originals, which very few are anymore, but Italians are the sort of the most common ones around, at least in most people's mind. Uh, Russians are sort of the, the, the most perfect kind of bee. They're very rare, but they're resilient to um, some things we're going to talk about, like varroa mites and other kind of insects. So the Russians are very high quality, but they're very rare and therefore more expensive than your regular honeybee. But if you've got 50 million bees flying around, guess what? They're going to become mutts because there's not going to be any straight lineage from anything. So they will commingle, and you'll end up with a whole bunch of mutts. That and there, the other question is, well, what kind of honey do you, you know are you growing, um, raising? Well, think about that too. Um, if you've got 40 acres of corn, which no one around here does, then you're going to have some corn honey um, or um, clover. The clover is a common, or even the most common is wildflower honey. Guess why? Because they don't have a clue where the bees are getting their pollen from, so it's wildflower. So it's just sort of a, an easy generalization. And uh, one of the other things about it is people always say, well, I need local honey. What's local honey? Well... <laughs> Local honey is not in your backyard. Local honey in Union in the upstate is Saluda, South Carolina, Saluda, North Carolina, Pickens over to Rock Hill. It's just the general region that you're in because the bees are pulling the honey, the, the nectar and the pollen from this area, and that's what you're trying to get to help with your allergies and stuff. Well, I, I like the name mutts. Uh, you know, you think of a little mutt dog or something That's like that. That's what it is. Uh, and the Italian, hmm. People will think, well, Italian, wow, that means uh, like pepperoni and spices Correct. that way. Yeah. Uh, so really local but, honey is kind of like a big region. It's not just really like it, local it, like yeah, that. People think it's a two, three mile. No, it's not. It's a, it's a large, it's the upstate, the now, Piedmont region of South Carolina. Okay, can you plant uh, certain flowers and uh, to, to help uh get a maybe a, a different quality of honey you can a lot of people do the with the clover the white clover versus the crimson clover i've had several years of crimson clover my bees don't like crimson but they love the white um which is what you'd normally have in your lawn white clover um buckwheat is a very good attractant um for the honeybees as well as a good ground cover when you're trying to improve your soil so i've grown buckwheat and it's a very dark it's like a molasses kind of color of a honey it's not quite that dark but it, it's it, it's on the very dark end of the spectrum versus a clover honey which is very light now this is a perception a lot of people and myself i wouldn't know between a honeybee versus a yellow jacket what, what is the difference in between those two bees one is mean one's mean <laughs> and one's docile that's the big difference right there uh looking uh have, the appearance, the honeybee is a little bit smaller typically. Um, it's, it is brown and has yellow, whereas the yellow jacket's a little bit larger, but very bright yellow and black. Uh, so yellow and black or yellow and dark brown. Uh, but their, their attitudes are totally different. You can be around honeybees. You can actually stick your hands up to them and they're not going to bite you. 
uh, unless you've done something to cause them to do that. Um, yellow jackets, you can look at yellow jackets. You can be across the room from a yellow jacket and they'll attack you. And chase you. And, <laughs> and keep on chasing you. And they bite multiple times, whereas honeybee, it gives its life up if it stings you. So if the stinger goes in you, it, it sticks in you, and it pulls its innards out when it is, and you can see it. It's just pulsating right there. Um, if you see a little bag on there, that's its abdomen just sitting there pumping the venom into you. So you, it, you really have to get them riled up to, to be that way. Now, where uh, does the yellow jackets versus uh uh, the honeybee live? Good question, because a lot of people don't realize the difference. A honeybee uh, typically goes into a box and travels upward. Uh, uh, yellow jacket typically lives in the ground, so it's flying and it goes down into the ground. And that's why the honeybee boxes are designed the way they are, because you go in the bottom and they climb up into the hive that they've created. The yellow jackets just do the reverse. They're flying down land, and they'll fly and keep on going in, you know, an old rat hole, a snake hole, or whatever, the hole that's there that they're going to build a new um, home in, a comb. Now, what types of honeybees are they, uh, we, we, know, we know Italians and Russians, but uh, like the queen and stuff like right. that. Is there, there are three types of honeybees. Um, the queen, as everybody knows, the, the queen bee, um, in a particular hive, and a colony is a hive, it's the same thing. Um, the hive is, is the box with the colony of bees in it, but it's interchangeable, colony or hive, they're talking about the same thing made up of a queen primarily. The others are worker bees, and they're all women, they're all female, all the workers, uh, of a typical hive that's 20,000, 40,000 bees, depending on how many boxes you stacked up, uh, and they grow, because you start with one or two, and they grow upwards. The, um, the majority of them are, are the women, the female worker bees, and drones are the other category. Those are the males. Um, the worker bees do everything. The females do everything. They go out and get the food. Uh, they're scouts. They, they guard the entrance. They um, build a wax comb. They bring the honey and the nectar back into the cells. Um, the only thing the queen does, and they take care of the queen primarily, the only thing the queen does is lay eggs. That's her whole purpose. She is designed just to lay eggs. She is basically an ovary. That's all she does. Now, is the queen, is it a different size than the workers and the drones? Is, is it a larger bee? or The queen is a somewhat larger. She has a longer abdomen, and she has shorter wings. The drones are the larger size insects, and they, they're they not much larger than the honeybee, and it's hard to tell. A lot of people confuse a drone because there's about a thousand drones in a typical hive of 40 or 50,000. So they're a small part, the queen being one, the drone being about a thousand, and all the rest of them are workers, um, which could be 30 or 40, up to 50,000 bees in one colony, one hive. Now, how, how many eggs does the uh, queen lay? Uh, during her lifetime, which is could be two years, three years, sometimes maybe four years, but not very often that four years, four years, they only last about three years. Uh, and they're, they're very expensive. You pay $35, $40 a piece for them. If you've lost one and you can replace it and they'll actually send through the mail, a little queen in a little small box about the size of a match car, um, live. And, um, she's in there protected. So how, she how, will lay, let's, let's get back she, with that. <laughs> she will lay about 800,000 eggs in her lifetime or, you know, First time she's brand new queen, she might lay a hundred a day and a thousand day after tomorrow, but that's her whole purpose in life. That's all she does is lay eggs. But so she's going to buy like 800,000 eggs. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of children. A lot of them. Yes. Now, <laughs> I get things in the mail and, and I order stuff. Right. It looks like sometimes when they get here, they've been run over by a truck. Yeah. And they'll send a queen bee. Right. Yeah. Does it come in the mail or UPS or? Uh, it, both, because it, you know, right now they're all sort of integrated together. But, um, yeah, so it's, it's a little box uh, about the size of a match car box, if you remember what those used to be. Yes, uh -huh. And it's made out of screen. It's, it's, it's got little wood pieces and screen, and she's in the center of it with two little plugs on each end. That um, once you get her, 
you know, she hadn't eaten in two days because typically they can get to them overnight nowadays. They'll overnight them to you. And that's, you know, $35 sometimes takes care of that shipping, but $40 should take care of the overnight shipping charge. So you, you go get the queen and then you take out the little rubber or, or the cork plugs in the thing. And then all, you, you don't open her up. You just lay her in between two frames inside the hive and just wedge her in there. And the, the two ends that the workers can come to, they start eating the little cap that's in there, the plug. And you, you don't want to pull it out and just drop her in there. You want her scent to permeate that hive and let them feel comfortable with her scent. And then that scent will allow the ferrum, it would allow them to um, get together and understand that their job now is to protect her at all costs. So she will be the one protected and they'll fend off anything else. So that's some powerful perfume. That's some real strong <laughs> stuff. <laughs> well, we're going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk a little bit, have you talk a little bit about the architectural, because yeah. that, that really is amazing to me. Uh, the the because, hexagonal. Because I've seen the boxes stacked up and I always wondered, well, how can they get the other ones out down there? So anyway, we're going to come back to that. Uh, well, you're listening to Frank Tiller uh, about how to raise bees and how to um, care for them, and you're going to learn a lot more. Uh, this is really interesting. Time flew by here pretty quick this past 15 minutes, so we're going to go to one of our uh, sponsors here, which is La Fagata, and we'll be right back with you, Frank Tiller, the professional beekeeper. La Fagata Mexican Restaurant, 441 North Duncan Bypass, Union, South Carolina, 864-429-4043. La Fagata, your family Mexican restaurants, has appetizers, child's plates, salads and soups, sandwiches, and desserts. Sizzling fajitas, Texas fajitas, shrimp fajitas. Also, they have great chicken, polos asado, chicken tenders, polo loco, and many more. If you like seafood, they have that also. Fish tacos, shrimp cocktail. They have many combinations that you can choose from in different price range. Matter of fact, they have 35 different ones. If you're a vegetarian, that's right, they can accommodate you also. Lunch menu, they have the Speedy Gonzales and about 13 others that you can make a combination with. That's La Fagata. La Fagata Mexican Restaurant. 441 North Duncan Bypass and Union, South Carolina. 429-4043. All right, we're back, and you can see the number, 864-441-9382. If you have any questions that you want to ask, uh, this is very interesting to me because we're, we're seeing kind of like God's creatures in work and, and, and doing some work. It's truly really amazing like that. So, you know, if we can train our wives and women folks to do all the work and we stay home and do nothing, wow, man, uh, I don't think we'd last too long. <laughs> well, that, there, that's the good side. There's a bad side. Oh, yes, and I know what the bad side's going to be when I get off this <laughs> here. Well, tell me a little bit about how you build, you call them brood boxes, correct? Brood box is just another word for the egg box, but let's finish up on that. Um, the the drones the drones have a very short life because all the workers don't need them over the winter. They don't need them taking their resources. They get rid of them. They push them out of the hive, so they're doomed at the end of in the late fall, early winter. They don't make it through the winter. Well, which ones push them out? The, the the ones that do all the work, the women, oh, really? the workers. So, yeah. So, as a, well, I'm so, going to change my mind on that one then. Well, there you go. I, I wanted to make sure you understood that part of it. Uh, their, their job is just to mate with the queen. That's all they do. And uh, the, the workers also uh, fight to death for the queen, correct? Or is that uh, The workers will protect the healthy queen. If they sense that she's unhealthy, they will go about their own business and raise another queen, and they will secrete royal jelly, which is a way that God has intended a new queen to be made. And um, there will be two or three or four, six queen cells that hang on the bottom of the frame as they're growing. And as they emerge, if the queen is not getting healthy or for some reason, they will allow one of those 
uh, queen cells to be successful and emerge, and they will kill the other ones, and they'll kill the old queen too. Right. Now, do you build the hives itself? Uh, I've done a little of each, but it's so much easier to, to buy the parts and assemble them. Uh, you can buy them ready assembled from you know several of the different manufacturers around the United States, uh, but you've you've seen the boxes that are very nicely put together versus uh, dovetail corners versus the ones that are just sort of like plywood. Uh, I wouldn't use plywood. I'd use you know some good pine or cedar to make them out of. But yeah, I, I've done some, but I buy most of them. Oh, okay. And the queen typically stays in the lower boxes her whole life, right? She just kind of just right. stays there. Her job is just to lay eggs, okay. and uh, that's where the brood is located, the eggs, um, the egg cells. And you were asking earlier that when I changed back, the, the, the hexagonal, the six-sided um, cells that the worker bees are making, they're all the same size no matter where they are. They, they're the, the the engineering of that hexagonal to go against the next one to go against the next one that whole system is unbelievably engineered uh and it, it could be a five foot run of them and they're perfectly side by side by side that it's just amazing and no tape measure and no tape measure oh. that's right yeah uh, no, now this, when you talk about the boxes it's not just an empty box you got Frames Correct, and stuff yeah. to go inside. A lot of people don't understand the construction of that. the uh, The first box is uh, just four four walls, and it doesn't have a top. And the bottom one does have a base to it because that's the landing board that the um, workers come in and land on. And it, it, that's there's they you always orient that towards the east um, or the south, uh, trying to get as much sunshine coming into it to warm it up as possible because they love heat they maintain themselves at 93 degrees and if it's less than that they get irritable if it's more than that they'll go outside and start bearding which is fanning themselves off and it looks like a, a man's beard they're just a huge cluster trying to cool themselves off but all the different functions that they they do um automatically is just, it's just amazing but yeah so the first box is the brood box sometimes they're very productive and you need to put a second brood box on top of that that has no top or a bottom on there just the four walls that, that holds the frames hanging so they're in the, they're usually eight or ten frames it used to be ten frames and they as years went on they became so heavy that started reducing the weight to make the boxes a little bit smaller there's a, something called b space b-e-e -E space meaning that the bees, uh, a, a guy named Landstroff back in the middle of the 1800s studied bees and he understood that the, it had to be large, the space that they needed to crawl through was larger than a quarter inch, but larger, smaller than three eighths of an inch. So we're talking about five sixteenths of an inch is bee space and that has to be there. If it's wider than that space, they'll fill it in with comb. And it just can you imagine if you had excess comb being filled in? It's a huge mess. If it's not enough, they'll bond it together with propolis, which is another thing that they'll this glue uh, that they bring in and make. And they will make everything. And you, you got to use your hive tool to pop that open because it's so well glued together, like super glue. It's, it's amazing. The engineers what they do. And, and this is like the, when you talk about like gluing together. It's like the wax that's that's in there, or is that something? Uh, well, different? it's not wax, but it's called propolis, which is it's more, much more bonding than the wax is. But yeah, the wax is something that they're also building, pulling in with the the pollen <clears throat> that they go out and in the nectar that they get from the flowers and stuff. Okay, now you got <clears throat> the upper boxes, which are called supers, or superiors. Supers. It's just superior. That super is what everybody calls them because it's it's short for superior, it meaning above. Uh, it's a superior box to the brood box, and that's where the honey is. And the queen never goes up there. She doesn't need to go up there. She's not laying eggs up there. And sometimes you get a mixture of brood and honey in the first or second box, but she doesn't go up there with the honey because uh, that's reserves. They're they're storing up for the winter time, and that's what we as beekeepers go in. We rob. Um, we always leave them enough to get through the winter um, because you don't want them, if, if you've taken too much of their honey from them and trying to sell it to people, um, then you're not going to have anything to get them by through the winter and you're going to be feeding them sugar water all winter long and that's not a fun thing to do either. So um, the you take enough 
and leave them enough to adequately survive and they know how to manage the rest of the stuff but you know you can't take it all and some people you know if they they try to get greedy and extract it all and then they're gonna lose their hive and sugar water how, how do you how do you feed them with sugar water you you go to walmart and you buy a 10 pound bag of sugar um and you make make it up one to one to one ratio with 10 pounds of water 10 pounds of sugar which ends up being uh, 12 cups of each you get a measuring cup and just put 12 cups of sugar in there and 12 cups of water actually you put the water on the stove first heat it up to right at boiling then you start adding the sugar into it um that way it, it you don't boil you don't have to boil it you just take it off the heat at that point and it will melt all the um honey uh, all the sugar and let it cool down you put it in quart jars and you put it upside down with teeny little holes in it um and put them in the hive and let them or on out actually there's a little stand that you stick onto the hive and They'll suck that down in, in one day. <laughs> I'll start to say, how long does that a, a last? Quart, a, a quart can last half a day or it can last a day, and sometimes it makes two days. But I've, uh, I've already been through 40 pounds of sugar in the last three weeks. So, <laughs> and that can get expensive. It can. Yeah. Yeah, it's another expense Especially that you've got to account for. Yeah, well, sugar goes, goes up as high as it does. Uh, now, you, you put, yeah, I've seen you put a, a screen for ventilation uh, the bottom is made of screen, but it also has a slot that you can put a quarter inch piece of plywood in there if they really get cold because they like it 93 degrees and in the wintertime it might get down to 20 degrees and it's hard really they can then in, in south in this area they they can actually keep it at 93 degrees all winter long but if you'll help them out by putting a solid board in there um that's that will take care of them and the screen's always there the screen's there not to keep them in but it's to keep predators out predators out okay and you're talking about keeping it 93 degrees is that difficult during the winter time especially when it gets down some our cold it is until you see how they work um that they are uh, very social critters and they start in a tight ball during the winter time and that's how they grow they grow from the center of the lowest frame outward so they start like a tennis ball and then they become the size of a soccer ball and then a basketball and that's getting 80 percent full of that box and at that point you better add the second frame the second box on top of that with frames because they will abscond and that's why it's a misnomer to call us beekeepers uh, we're bee managers you know we are trying to keep the bees there and uh, they they will leave if if we have not presented them a house that is ready for them to maintain and grow in they'll, they'll just pick up and leave take the queen with her now do you do you use any lamps sometimes when it gets real cold or is it just uh, i guess some people do i never have um because they can generate enough body heat to themselves by vibration uh or, around the queen they keep a little bit of space and air in there but the out layered ones you know if it's the size of a basketball those outside worker bees are the ones doing all the holding on to each other and they rotate they, they, they will go to the inside and have bring some pollen and nectar that they can feed off of during the winter time but they never leave as long as it's 55 degrees or below they stay inside the hive all winter long so they have to have enough stores you know that they've that they've made to keep them through the winter does bees sleep any they do um five or six seven eight hours a day you know they 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 sort of i guess like humans when it comes to needing sleep yeah they have to sleep they have to rest but um the workers work and the drones don't now, do they <laughs> I mean, do they fun. take this in shifts and they and, do uh -huh. and, and that way it's almost kind of like a yeah. something going activity that's right because if if they they can overwork themselves and kill themselves um just by working too much and you'll see uh, a couple dozen of them at the front of that landing board um they'll just they'll just push them out of the way and just clean them up but um they're very good housekeepers now if it gets a little bit if they get some dampness in there how how do they get that out because i know we have all this rain stuff sometimes comes That's in, right. and they coming in and out of the rain and there are uh, three primary things that the honeybees hate and one of them is dampness now they bringing in nectar that's wet and damp and there's some bees that go out and bring water to help make it match you know, make it make it up um so they there there's there's a amount of moisture that they're trying to get rid of to begin with and they use their wings to fan that down to get rid of to help evaporation process in the hive uh, another thing they hate is 
coldness or extreme heat. So um, they will, if it's real hot, they'll go outside and it's called bearding, uh, like a human, a man's beard, and they'll just hang all over the place. They're trying to cool down. They're trying to cool down the inside to maintain the 93 degrees. Um, and if it's you know real cold inside, they like we were talking about, they they just cluster together and maintain their own little sphere of 93 degrees, and they hate wind. So if you go out and try to operate your hive and, and inspect them, which you need to do regularly in the winter time, you chose because you had time to do it, and they didn't like the weather. It was 45 degrees, and it was windy, and it was damp, raining. You have just opened up a uh, 50,000, at this point it's probably 20,000 that made it through the winter. Insects, it's going to light you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, we're going to get into the age and life of bees here in just a minute. We will come back right after these messages by La Fagata. You're uh, listening to Frank Tiller, a professional beekeeper, and he knows his stuff there, and I'm learning a lot of stuff, and I hope you are too. So we'll be right back right after La Fagata. La Fagala Mexican Restaurant, 441 North Duncan Bypass, Union, South Carolina, 864-429-4043. La Fagala, your family Mexican restaurants, has appetizers, child's plates, salads and soups, sandwiches, and desserts. Sizzling fajitas, Texas fajitas, shrimp fajitas. Also, they have great chicken, polo asado, chicken tenders, polo loco, and many more. If you like seafood, they have that also. Fish tacos, shrimp cocktail. They have many combinations that you can choose from in different price range. Matter of fact, they have 35 different ones. If you're a vegetarian, that's right, they can come accommodate you also. Lunch menu, they have the Speedy Gonzales and about 13 others that you can make a combination with. That's La Fagata. La Fagata Mexican Restaurant. 441 North Duncan Bypass and Union, South Carolina. 429-4043. All right, we're back, and you're listening to Frank Tiller and telling us all about honeybees and not just your regular kind of bees, uh, the fascinating world of honeybees that God put here to help us eat better and also have some wonderful honey too. If you love honey, we all love honey and how the bees do all this stuff. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Uh, Frank, uh, what about the age of the bees? I know they don't last forever. Uh, tell us a little bit about that if you would. The queens uh, will last longer, and, and she will last uh, two to three to four years, typically. Um, the worker bees um, work somewhere around 30 to 50 days, um, depending on how, the quality of them. And the drones will be shorter than that. Drones just don't make it long, 28 days. <laughs> um, Again, all thing drone does is want to mate with the queen, and you know there's only one time that that queen gets mated, so they're pretty useless after that fact. Uh, oh. They live their life just hoping to be mated. So <laughs> now, the uniform you wear, the 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 helmet stuff like that, and I know you said you can stick your hand down in there as long as it's uh, warm weather That's and right. things like that. It, it's it's not. Messing with the bees, uh, correct. Yeah. Uh, goings and ins and outs, and uh, do you? Why do you wear that protect protection? Uh, head protection is just a safety issue. Um, some beekeepers don't, and they pay the price. You've seen on the internet every now and then, a guy's one side of his face is all swollen up because he got stung. Um, bees typically like to go start in low, and they go up into the hive. Well, they don't know that your nose is not a hive, so they will go in and up. And if you get stung in your nose, you could actually die from that. Um, of course, if you're allergic to them, you could die from that too. But they like little holes like your ears. And um, so keeping your mouth closed and keeping something protecting your face and your neck with a, a veil that's 
part of a hat system. So you got your hat, the veil hangs off of that, and there's usually a zipper into your jacket, a bee jacket. So you've got a system that's at least down to your waist that's keeping the bees from getting, because they, they're, they're curious that they're going to, one of the worst things you can do is be on a hot summer day and you're sweating and you feel your sweat. Normally it goes down your spine, but if you feel sweat coming up your spine and you're standing up, you're getting ready to get lit up because you got to be inside your jacket up against your skin and they're crawling right on up to the top like they normally do. They want to know what's up there and you're going to get lit up. <laughs> so do they how aggressive do they get uh when you're messing with them because because we're going to show a video here in a minute uh, where uh, what these bees look like and you went there to retrieve these bees yeah every now and then you get blessed and have a swarm come to you instead of you know get a call to go to them uh, i was very fortunate last week that i had three swarms come to me um and they were just hanging in a small peach tree right in front of my hives seven or eight feet away and they were very they were very large swarms <clears throat> and then there's going to be another one that we're going to see from downtown spartanburg that i got called in on friday night that they were cutting some trees down and found out that it was a hollow tree that they cut off about two and a half feet up and it, it was slammed full of honey and of course as we talked about the eggs and everything are down low which means ground level and possibly if there was a hollowness below the ground the queen and the um, the brood is all down low and it could be ground level whereas the honey started at, at two feet up and higher so they cut it off at two and a half feet not knowing what was in there because they didn't think anything was in there and tens of thousands of bees erupted of course that stopped their working for the day and I got the phone call to come up there and see if I could get them but when I started removing the bees that were excited all that comb when you open it and you try to take it out in a in a long large piece but it breaks and then that honey will just start dripping down guess where that honey gravity is going to take it down to where the queen is so i don't know in this particular video that might see whether the queen made it or not uh, i went for the last two days i went over there saturday went over there sunday evening all those bees seem to still be there which sort of amazing because it was open it didn't have a top on it or anything and it did sprinkle a little bit but they're loyal they were just sitting there so I'm assuming that the queen is still there or her scent's real strong. So one of the two, um, that, that tomorrow they may leave, but more than likely they're going to be there because that scent's so strong. And I'm hoping the queen's there, but it'll be unbelievably successful if I'm able to find the queen knowing all that comb and honey drip down. So it's just one of those things. Sometimes you can, so, but a stump is the hardest thing. A tree is the hardest thing to get bees out of. Because it's just hard to get to. It's right? just hard to get to and, where the and, queen is. And, and plus, you're disturbing. Oh yeah. And I have tore, torn them. Yeah, I have removed the, in, the contents of their house. <laughs> now, did uh, did the workers when they found uh, this uh, unfounded uh, beehive and uh, did, did any of them get stung? Um, every time I had to put my hands in there, I had gloves on, I had the veil on, but every time I stuck it in there, because I was sticking my hands down in a tree trunk two and a half feet down to get towards the bottom carefully not to crush the queen not i couldn't see her so i could just sort of gently pull the comb out and every time i stuck my hands in there i had gloves on and they would sting me every time it's not that bad a sting um so i got 10 maybe 12 stings uh just pulling the comb out of that two foot two and a half foot area right there and then I left them alone because all the comb was gone. I just couldn't see what was left down there at that point. It got too dark Sunday night. So, well, did the uh, uh, didn't the gloves protect you from the stings? Uh, typically, I mean, my gloves are several years old, so it's not right. like they were brand new. Brand new gloves, probably. I learned a lesson a long time ago. I just didn't have any uh, like latex or gloves that I should have put on as a liner first, and then my uh, honeybee gloves on top of that that are leather, but um it's not that bad i mean it's they they typically go after a soft spot I and mean, they were going over my palm of my hand where because i was when you when you crush them they that they don't like that either get crushed and that they emit another um hormone that uh, for Rome that that just makes them angry with you so they the other bees smell that and they say oh we're being attacked so right they so, light, light you up now the, the, the gloves that you put on you said there's leather 
Mm -hmm. Very thin leather, uh, is, like golfing is, gloves. Yeah. Is it hard to reach in there and, and get the hive out without crushing the bees? It is because that's what happened when you're, if you don't have any kind of tool and I didn't want to use a tool like a big shovel or anything, that's the only thing I could have reached down in the hole with. So I just reached in with my hands and the gloves come up to you here and your coat comes down to here. So you got double protection on your arms, forearms, but your, your fingertips, um, that's why a lot of bee, uh, beekeepers don't use gloves at all. They want to be able to feel those frames and they can feel when they gently put their fingers out there if there's a bee on the back side of it and they just slide their hands over and just knock the bee out of the way and just lift that frame out. That's really the best way of doing it if you've got optimal conditions. Right, well. And I didn't have optimal conditions. Yeah, well, digging, going into a stump there, it would be kind of hard to uh, to do that. And, and But... It, your hand didn't swell from the bee sting because most yeah. people was relating that like probably to a yellow jacket or right, a wasp yeah, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, not a yellow jacket sting or wasp sting. Um, I guess when I was a little kid, bumblebee sting and stuff like that, yeah, I would swell up. And um, but I guess I've been stung so many times it just something doesn't bother me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I may say something that I shouldn't say, when, when, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it it happens. You'll you know. say ouch and uh, yeah, go go with ouch. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's amazing now. Typically on a, um, I'll probably come to that here in just a sec. Uh, the, the honey, what amazes me is you got some that's got the comb. Um, sirewood honey. Uh, I've heard people say, that, you know, get you some sirewood honey. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what in your boxes or is that where the bees pollinate or uh, bringing in? What the, the type that the flavor that they're making? Right. Uh, well, it, it all depends on where they're going out and getting their resources from. So, right. sourwood is going to be sourwood tree that they're around tulip poplars. They love tulip poplars, and you you'll get that kind of honey. Yeah, because I, I hear that not knowing. I was always seeing, well, that's that's sourwood uh, honey right there, and, yeah. and you think, well, that's premium. That's uh, yeah, that's top top the line right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but again, it's a blend of other things because there are no purists out there. Just like the the the, the lineage of the, the bees themselves, it, it, it's a mixture. So now this is a question that uh, that everybody's wondering: Can you make money uh, being a beekeeper? <laughs> um, you've got to count the cost, um, like in anything. You you can go in and just have one or two hives and uh, just enjoy that and not spend a lot of money but you you've got the the enemies that you're going to have to take care of the varroa mites and the small hive beetles and wax moths uh years ago they weren't such a big problem but with the pesticides insecticides and everything that sort of have changed the chemistry of all the insects and stuff and they're a problem now, and you've got to treat them regularly. Uh, the Varroa mite is a tiny little, like the end of a ballpoint pen, and it will attach itself to the larva and start getting, as the larva and the pupa grow, um, it, it just starts messing with their bloodstream, the bloodline. It does the same thing to a, an adult. It will attach itself to the abdomen of the honeybee, and it, it, it will kill your you know, over time it's going to kill your hive. So you've got to eradicate that with whatever formic acid or whatever chemical that you know have to use to treat it to eradicate that. So there's procedures to go through with that. You can use just enough and you can't use any more than that. So it's a, it's an issue that you got to deal with. So you have the enemies that comes in and uh, can wipe out your hive. Can, yeah. uh, so, can, can it uh, uh, mess your honey up? I mean, can it... Uh, the, uh, the, well, you don't like contamination of any kind of thing. You like pure, you know, unpasteurized honey. So you you, you want to try to minimize all of that. At the same time, you don't want to inject any kind of chemicals into your honey. Um, so it, it's a procedure you got to go through. Um, and a lot of states are really tough on that stuff. Uh, some states don't even allow it. But um, so, but you've got to you've got to maintain it because uh, they it needs excess help then the natural and when you take the honey out of the hive like that do you, do you put it in big buckets uh and take yeah. it comb with you and right there's a process there when you're starting to remove uh the frames out of the boxes the supers and you they're full of you know it's full of honey but guess what's attached to the honey 
there's thousands of worker bees attached there. So you have to take a little feather or a brush, very light, and, and knock the bees off of it and take that and then stick it in an empty box over here, put lid back on it, and then go back to your hive. You know, it might be six or eight feet away, um, and they can smell that, so you got to co cover that up as you do this and take another change to put that one over. So you're trying to remove as many bees as you can, and ultimately you're going to get to a frame a, a place with all these frames that are full of honey and you want to decap them because the bees the worker bees have capped all that honey and so you're going to have to take a hot knife or just um, a sharp knife serrated blade and take all those cappings off and they'll just fall and you can reuse that wax again uh, you can actually help start some um, frames growing with that that wax but the honey when it will start coming out and, and draining so you want to put it in a clear plastic box over here and then you're going to get maybe two um, supers three supers four supers and, and those supers are going to weigh 30 or 40 pounds a piece so you're starting to accumulate gallons of honey just by this one hive okay so it, it's it's pretty neat that uh, when you're trying to and then you've got to if you've got an extractor, you can do a gravity method that takes two or three days through a strainer, multiple strainers, or you can buy an extractor that spins and you can hand crank it like the old ice cream churns, uh -huh. or you can be put some more money out and get a motorized one that spins it. And, you know, in five, ten minutes, it'll spin all the honey out, and then you can put more frames in there and spin all the honey out, and you, end, you could end up easily with uh, 20 or 30 gallons that day. Um, well, I know a lot of people uh, will buy us honey, uh, and they look at it and say, "Well, I want the kind that's got the wax in it." Oh yeah, yeah. And I like I like the wax too. Yeah. All right. And do, a lot of people don't, but some people do. Right. Do, do you, can you eat the wax? Absolutely. Yeah. And got a lot of uses at that point. Uh, you can use the wax for all kinds of things. I, that's some people do it just for the byproducts, such as you know the hand creams, the face creams, all kind of. Uh, there's all kinds of things that the wax can be used for. Um, I got into it for pollination purposes, and a lot of people in Florida will put all their hives on an 18-wheeler and send it to California and pollinate the almond crops. And without the honeybees coming out of Florida, and South Carolina is a big uh, supplier of the honeybees that are shipped uh, for six weeks to California just to pollinate the almond crop out there. Well, uh, well, I know they use beeswax for candles. Absolutely, yeah. You know, so, yeah, that's pretty neat. Well, we're going to come right back, and uh, we're going to show you the video that uh, that uh, Frank was called out to Spartanburg, and you're going to see all these bees, and if you're afraid of bees, <laughs> turn away, but these are a lot of bees. So we'll be right back right after this with La Fagata. La Fagata Mexican Restaurant, 441 North Duncan Bypass, Union, South Carolina, 864-429-4043. La Fagata, your family Mexican restaurants, has appetizers, child's plates, salads and soups, sandwiches, and desserts. Sizzling fajitas, Texas fajitas, shrimp fajitas. Also, they have great chicken, polos asado, chicken tenders, polo loco, and many more. If you like seafood, they have that also. Fish tacos, shrimp cocktail. They have many combinations that you can choose from in different price range. Matter of fact, they have 35 different ones. If you're a vegetarian, that's right, they can come accommodate you also. Lunch menu, they have the Speedy Gonzales and about 13 others that you can make a combination with. That's La Fagata. La Fagata Mexican Restaurant. 441 North Duncan Bypass and Union, South Carolina. 429-4043. Make sure I saw what you see what you're playing. All right, we're back with you here. Let me uh cue this uh up. You're gonna see now uh in Spartanburg where Frank was called because uh the workers found some honey tree yeah, <laughs> the tree they were cutting trees down uh those are the workers that we're talking about yeah right that's the workers not the bee workers yeah. but they found uh they found some more uh and they called uh frank to come and see if he can extract them and uh maybe 
uh, I guess they could call Pooh Bear, you know. <laughs> they always shows him sticking his hands That's in there. That's right. That's not so. But I'm, I'm going to let you look at this right here. Okay, Frank, uh, how many bees do you think that was? <laughs> um, the residuals, there, there's probably 10,000 bees right there that you could see. And so I probably removed 40 or 50,000 bees. It was a huge hive. Now, did you, did you get any honey out of that? Um, possibly. Um, I've actually used it as bait to try to lure the other ones out. Uh, one of the best things to lure them out of a tree or tree stump is to use their brood or some bees brood and put it in your uh, empty hive and put it right adjacent to them. Um, and that's the game you're playing. You're trying to entice them out of where they are. They have no roof over their head at this point and uh, they're open to coolness of the, the night sky and, and uh, nighttime temperatures and they may fall for it they uh, it, it's an outside chance that i'm gonna get the queen out of that group but i did bring a whole bunch of of hive um comb honeycomb and brood which is the egg cells of them so uh if the next day or two i can't get them out of there i probably will mail order a queen um you know, pay 30 35 dollars to get a queen and at least put them two queens one in each of the boxes that i've got slammed full of their brood now honey is not weighed by pounds uh or is weighed by pounds mm -hmm. and not liquid because right. we usually go to the store and look at the liquids we're saying well we've got 16 ounces or five right. ounces of, uh, of honey right uh now how much per pound basically does the honey weigh um well, I, I took some notes on that. The, the, just to give you an idea, water weighs about 16 ounces per pound. Well, you know, there's 16 ounces in a pound and 16 liquid ounces. Honey is a little more concentrated. It's thicker, more dense. So you get about 11 liquid ounces per pound of honey. Um, so when you're trying to do the math on this, one pound of honey, which is 16 liquid ounces, it sells for 15 to 20 dollars so it's not going to be a full quart that's going to be more um but as far as numbers are concerned um you're you're probably talking somewhere around 15 dollars a pound and each of those supers you can should expect 25 to 40 pounds of honey in each super and you may have i've got one hive right now it's got five supers slammed full of honey so it'd be five times this amount but for one super at fifteen dollars a pound purchase price, thirty pounds is four hundred fifty dollars. So you think that's a lot of money, <laughs> but that's a lot of time and a lot of stuff that you have to have to make that happen. Right, and even though the bees are doing all the work, that's right. You've got a lot of work to do Absolutely. too to, to yeah. get this out. Uh, I know some honey; it seems like is thinner than others. Is, is, is that because unscrupulous salesmen out there they water it down? Okay, because how thick would it be? Like, I know yeah, molasses. It's not cool. Yeah, you know, it's sometimes it's thicker than some molasses, but uh, it is. You don't want that water content in there at all. It shouldn't be in there, and it it will crystallize real quickly with the high moisture water content in there, and you don't you don't want that. If some honey will crystallize regardless, and you can heat it up, not boil it, but just warm it up, 110, 115 degrees. That's enough to decrystallize it. So it's sort of like a um, what they call a double boiler. You, you boil some water and then you put a jar inside of that, not against the bottom, but elevated a little bit. And that can heat it up enough to de uncrystallize the, the honey that's there. But uh, typically, you know, honey, just if it's coming out and, you, and all you've done is 
filtered it, then uh, you, you should be good to go. And they say they found honey in Egyptian mon um, pyramids and stuff 3,000 years old. So. I, I was going to bring that up. I, I read something, and this is way before. I wouldn't or, eat it, but that's. <laughs> I'd be a little worried about that one too. But they said that's the only food that really could it's last preserved. It's preserved. a lifetime, even that's if right. it crystallized. Yep. If you add water to it, I believe it is. I'm not sure about adding anything to it, but it, it, if it's it would crystallized, come, you can warm it up to. It might be what it is. Yeah. That you can warm it up and it comes back. Right. Yeah. You uh, don't have to add anything to it if it's pure honey. So. Yeah. You need to try that. Like, okay, put your put your some alpha uh, and, and just leave it for several years, say yeah. five years, and yeah. uh, come back to it and. I'm not going to help you eat it, yeah, but there you uh, go. That's right. <laughs> but that you know, it, it's it's just amazing how these workers and please people just don't swat a bee not knowing what it is uh, because it's it could be a honeybee and and, it, and it's viable for our what we eat all kind of uses and uh, and you run across this all the time where people really don't understand and know. Uh, about honeybees. Yeah. Now, do they typically come like a if they move from one place a big swarm, well, uh, kind well, of like locusts in a way. Uh, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it's it could look like a a locust swarm that you read about. Um, but honey, you can. I was talking to a golfer the other day. He says when we hear them on the golf course, you can hear them. You know, a couple hundred yards off, and you can see the sky in that little area. It's a cloud, and so they they all ran. It was so funny when he was telling me that. But because uh, I never, I don't play golf, so but I can imagine some professional golfers doing it. Well, I'd that. probably be the one that would be running to. <laughs> yeah, uh, you would probably go running the directions where they're at. Well, I'd, I'd be curious, more than curious. But you know, you just got to understand what their temper, uh, how what their attitude is at that point. Uh, if if they're aggressive, um, then look out. But typically, they're not. They're very docile. Unlike a yellow jacket, I don't like yellow jacket. No, yellow jackets just plain out mean. It's about like a, a hornet. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> now, I was looking kind of on some of your notes here also. Uh, clothing, tools, smoker, equipment, hive boxes, frames, foundation, bottles, labels, extractor. can range anywhere from 500 to 5,000, depending on how many you get and how elaborate, That's right? right? That's right. Um, you could start out, you know, expecting to spend three to $500 on one or two hives um, because you You've got to be prepared for the next step. If if you're not prepared for the next step, guess what's going to happen? They don't think you're going to take care of them. They're not really thinking that. They're just looking at their surroundings, and they're saying, we're out of here. And half the hive and the queen takes off, and then you have nothing until you get another queen that's left. Hopefully, then you have to buy the queen. So you've got to take care of them. How do you take care of them? By having more hives, boxes, and frames ready to be put on top. Um, it, it, it's just an open cavity boxes with frames in there. As they grow, they growing up and making all the honey up there, and they're raising all their members down below. So, I see you got a quote down here. As someone wants to take <laughs> this as a hobby, and uh, what's the first thing that the, <laughs> you got advice as someone that's going to take this as a hobby besides? They need to be serious about there, it. There, there's, there's several little truisms that I say, um, but there's one that's sort of famous if you're talking about the money side. If you can't afford to take a $100 bill and burn it, this hobby is probably not for you. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, it is, and it is, and you're dealing with, you know, like you said, uh, these insects here, this, these bees, uh, they're living creatures. You know, and and it's like anything. If you don't take it, they're going to move. That's right. <laughs> they're going to go somewhere else and live. That's right. And probably find your place and uh, <laughs> hope you rescue them. Yeah. Uh, you take that. care of them, they'll take care of you. Yeah. Right. Is there any particular place that you that uh, that you can find swarms or, 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 or bees, or are they just, just anywhere? Well, um, there are a lot of beekeepers out there already, and, of course, they're raising bees, such as myself. Um, and like I said, we're not called beekeepers, really. We're called bee managers. We're trying to manage them while we have them under our thumb. Um, so I may have received several neighbors. You know, I don't know where they came from. They just appeared a couple, three days in a row. And hopefully I've given them a, a house that they, they're going to want to live and grow in. Um, but some are just like the picture that you saw from downtown Spartanburg. Um, 
in a tree. They, they, those were, as far as I know, they've been there for several years because there was some real old, dark, almost black comb right up against brand new, almost white comb. Uh, most of it sort of yellowy wax looking, but um, that that that's been in there a long time, and uh, well, probably I'm guessing at least ten or fifteen years. Wow. Well, Frank, we appreciate you being on the show. We're going to wind it up here. And uh, we've, we've learned a lot. And uh, we, we thank you so much for coming. And, folks, if you stand tuned until next Monday, we're going to have Mr. Earnhardt uh, here. And uh, also Scarlett's going to come back and visit with us a little bit. And uh, we're going to have uh, talk about old cars and stuff. And you've uh, listened to Primetime with Jerry McKee. And you're my special guest was Frank Tiller and a bee manager. <laughs> I've learned something new there too. You have a good night and hope you have a blessed week. And I'm Jeremy Key and we're out of here.